Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and this one is really special. It's with Sean Tucker, a photographer, and I wanted to say at the very beginning that this is not barbecue related, and we do not talk about barbecue at all. So if that's the only reason why you come to this channel, I want to let you know so you could skip to a different one, but I would recommend staying because Sean is one of the most inspirational people I've ever talked to, and his YouTube channel, which I'll put a link below, is spectacular. A dear friend of mine, Kelly Yandel, who's also a brilliant and thoughtful photographer, she sent me a link to his YouTube channel and said that it was something that I probably would like, and I just devoured it. It's fantastic. It's a photography channel, but it's more about finding self-awareness and finding a path towards creativity. And as he says in this interview, photography is a Trojan horse. It's just, it's just a vehicle to get you into his world. And then he talks about philosophy and psychology, but it's, it's wrapped in, in little stories and I guarantee you, you'll be inspired. It'll make you a more introspective creator or maker or whatever it is that you do. So I definitely recommend that. He has a book called The Meaning in the Making, which is spectacular. There's some overlap with this channel, but this is a wonderful, inspiring piece. And he also has a link on his website, which I'll put a link below, to order an audio version of it. So it's him speaking the book, and it's fantastic. And you can order it anywhere in the world. I'm in the United States, and I ordered it easily. So I wanted to reach out to him to hear his story, to share his story with you guys, and also to hopefully glean some inspiration, and hopefully that would rub off on you guys as well. So I can't thank Sean enough for taking the time. I know you guys are going to thoroughly enjoy this. I have a website at kevinsbbqjoints.com with links to all my podcasts and YouTube stuff. But at the end, stay safe and visit your local barbecue joint. Good morning. <laughs> <My side. laughs> yeah. How are you doing today, Sean? Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, i am just come off a week of COVID. So I'm... Uh, oh, you had just, it? Yeah, last week. Um, uh, I've been testing negative since the weekend. So um, I'm out of the woods now. Thankfully, it wasn't a, yeah, it wasn't too you. rough for me personally. It was a, it felt like a, um, I don't know, like a medium cold really. Um, so I'm bouncing back from that, but otherwise all good. Would you, you have even known you had it if? No, I mean, I, I would have, I was talking to someone about this the other day. I would have just assumed it was just a cold. I would have gone out as normal. I would have hung out with people because I would have been like, well, I've just got a little cold. There's no reason not to go yeah. to work and do things you need to do. Um, but we live in a different world, don't we? <laughs> so, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So it's, and it's a world that I had never envisioned. I, I have a strange memory. I mean, I have a strange imagination about like what a pandemic, like I had always thought, like, I wonder what a pandem pandemic would mm -hmm. be like, or, or a terrible virus that, and, but then I never knew we'd be living through it. I never knew it would have the layers and the political layers and all the different, oh, yeah. uh, those things I never thought for sure. But mm -hmm. I, uh, I also, I also just, I never knew that this would um, be something that we could actually live with. I thought that, you know, it would be the, uh, either the end of times or whatever, mm -hmm. but I'm glad, I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're feeling better and that, you know, gosh, uh, it's, it's nice that we can, you know, this, I think this what is I, the fourth, fourth wave. So you probably have like the BA two and you know, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Well, yeah. One of the but fancy I, ones. Yeah. Fancy, <laughs> you have the more, yeah, the more evolved version of COVID. Mm -hmm. But I, I, and I wanted to, which was something that I, like, I touched on just with my imagination. Do you still love ghost stories? This is so. This is gonna be the most tangential interview <laughs> I've ever done. But do you still? Because I know that you had talked about I had one of a podcast that you were on or something. You were talking about ghost stories, and that was something that you were interested in as a child. Do you still like ghost stories? I think I think I put them somewhere different in my head now. Like I don't necessarily know what I think about all that, but I love this idea that people in loads of cultures around the world reach for more, you know, and assume that there's more going on than we can see. I kind of love that. And that's always yeah. been in me, I think, which is what probably led me into spirituality and the church and the rest of it. I mean, personally, I can't claim to have ever to have ever seen anything myself like that, I can't explain, but I was desperately looking for it as a 10, 11, 12 year old. Yeah, same with um, me. It was my grandmother actually, who, who was the one who like, she was the one who really seemed to see stuff that she couldn't explain and had this sort of connection to other stuff, but she's not somebody who's a dishonest person. So, and, and I knew her as that, so there's no reason for her to lie. But I remember her walking, I wasn't there, but she walked into a pub in a uh, in a little town on the Welsh border called Ludlow uh, with my grandfather and um, they kind of walked in the front door and off to the left there was sort of the old lounge area and a fireplace and there were a few a couple of old chairs by the fireplace 
And he said to her, why don't we go sit by the fireplace? We'll, we'll order a coffee. And she said, no, we can't sit there. That gentleman's sitting there. And he's like, who are you talking about? And she's like, the, the man who's sitting there. And he couldn't see anybody sitting there. And they, the person at the reception overheard her say that. And she said, yeah, she's not the first person who's seen him. Like, so, you know, stuff oh, like that. Yeah. You're like, well, I mean, I can't see stuff like that. I haven't. But, you know, I also know enough to know that I don't know everything. So maybe <laughs> who knows yeah. how things work? Who knows what happens? But, yeah, I, I, I find it interesting. I just can't claim to know anything or have seen anything myself. It's hard to weave it into the fabric of your mind, like how to how to figure how to how to weave it into everything that you believe in in life. Yeah. And it's it's difficult. I, I in a past life, because because you talk about how you photograph furniture and we'll get to all the, your backstory. Mm. But uh, I, I sold furniture with my father when he was alive. Mm. That was high end furniture to hotels and resorts and things. And we had met with a woman who worked at the Hotel Del Coronado, which is in San Diego, and it's it's haunted or supposedly haunted. And there's rooms that people either don't stay in or they want to stay in because they're haunted. <laughs> and she's and we were at lunch for something, and I sat next to her. And she talked about ghosts, and she said that she that that there's a desk that's haunted, and there's a chip table, and there's these things and in her office. And then she talked about the ghosts at the place. But then she said she went to London. And she was overwhelmed by the amount of ghosts that she would, it was, it was too much. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting. I guess there's, yeah, there'd be more over where you are. There's more, more ghosts than maybe over here, yeah. different ghosts. But, yeah, but yeah. you, so you were born in the United Kingdom, but then at six months, did you move to? Yeah. So, well, um, born in, born just outside London. And then okay. six months old, we moved to Zimbabwe, which is a country in Southern Africa. Okay. Um, and then it was uh, my parents split up when I was four years old and my mom, my brother and I came back to the UK. Um, but my mom just missed Africa. She wanted to live there. So uh, I think it would have been a few years after that. We moved to Botswana uh, where she met the local Barclays bank manager. And um, yeah, they got together and got married. And then following him around, it was kind of three years in a post because he was one of these expat bank managers. So it was back to the UK for a bit and then Lesotho for a few years Swaziland for a few years and then yeah I eventually wound up in South Africa where I did my kind of studying and working until well, 2012 when I moved back to the UK permanently. What was that like moving around that much? Uh, it was difficult initially I, I, as I was in and out of a lot of schools as well and a lot of that time was boarding schools too so I was when my parents were living in Lesotho there just weren't really good schools in Lesotho so I was sent to boarding school in the UK which meant that at nine years old I was packed off on a plane and sent to the other side of the world to go schooling. So I was backwards and forwards six times a year on my own. So oh. I think what happened was, is I, oh, wow. I grew up very quickly and I decided that I needed to be uh, independent very fast, especially because with my mom remarrying as well and uh, her and my stepfather having my, uh, my sister, my brother and I, who was sort of from this previous marriage and my stepdad was quite clear about the fact he didn't really want to have a lot to do with us. We were shipped off to boarding school. And I think we felt like, we didn't belong in this new family that was forming. So being sent away oh. very young to uh, the other side of the planet and kind of being left to fend for yourself, I, I was like, well, if I, don't, if I don't sort myself out, I'm in real trouble here. So, you know, I, was, I had these weird, I mean, the example I give is like, uh, and I think I talk about it in the book a little bit, is like I used to, when you used to go at that age and you flew on your own, um, like nine years old, you were basically teamed up with an air hostess who would take you, meet you at the front of the airport and walk you through the airport and would take you on the plane and make sure you met somebody on the other end and you get this little sticker, which they put on your, your, your jersey, which would say young flyer. But quickly I was like, no, there's no, I don't need your help. And I would, I would lose her and I would tear off the sticker and I would throw it in the rubbish and I would lose her so I could make my own way through. I still have my Garfield teddy bear that I was carrying with me, but I was going to sort myself out. I knew where I was going. So I think I, I, I wanted to grow up very fast and sort of become self-sufficient because I just felt like all the support structures I had, I couldn't trust them. Everything oh, yeah, was moving yeah. around too much, you know? Do you think, I, I wonder how much, because you, you seem and you, you discuss in your book, and you discuss in your channel and we'll get to the book and the channel, but uh, how you're an introvert and mm -hmm. like, I'm an introvert, I, but I also, I can be with people and I, it's, yeah. but I'm, I, I'm, a, I don't love crowds and you're not a huge fan of crowds, but do you think that a lot of that independence has, has stayed with you for your entire life? Do you feel like you're and it, and you go off on these retreats too? But. Yeah, I like it. I mean, I, um, 
I've always, I, I, since then, I've always been somebody who just sort of gets on with it and does their own thing. I've moved around a lot. I can, I can pretty much, I feel like I can pretty much start again at any point in my life and I'll be fine. Um, and uh, I guess the introvert thing, I mean, I, the best definition I've heard of introvert extrovert is, is an introvert is somebody who gets their energy back by being on their own. But an extrovert is somebody who gets their energy by being around other people. Whereas an introvert, that'll take energy from you. So I, I still consider myself like a, a confident introvert. I can be around other people, but I find it taxing and I prefer to be on my own to get energy back. So yeah, I think, you know, combined with that sort of, I'll take care of myself and also I get energy on my own has led to maybe a more kind of introspective mode for myself that works for me. And like you talk about too, is there's, there's so many things that are, there's so many distractions and there's so many things we're bombarded with so much at any given moment and, and also sounds too. I think there's, it's, it's loud when, once you're somewhere away from sounds, it's, it's different and you realize, wow, it's, I, the city's a pretty noisy place. And I live in mm -hmm. the, like, suburbia, which is essentially in, out, outside of Los Angeles is still the city. And mm. there's always some kind of hum of something mm -hmm. or some kind of something in the background. But, but so when did you, your, your plan was to become a pastor? Is that what you wanted to do? Is that, was that the goal or was it to be a Priest, there were a or... few really i mean i think i think i always had this spiritual bent as a kid that i talked about but initially like when i was in high school i became obsessed with wildlife actually was what i really wanted to do so i read loads of books on rehabilitating big cats back into the wild so um george and joy adamson mark and delia owens um gareth patterson that kind of stuff john varty and i just decided i i've read 30 40 books on this stuff i sort of devoured them in high school and then um, when I actually ended up at university, I started, I enrolled in a degree in wildlife sciences, but just oh. completely flunked. Uh, so I, 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 my maths wasn't strong enough. And my chemistry wasn't strong enough. Uh, maths and sciences, I was never very good at. So, and they, they had quite an aggressive way of whittling out students because they started the course with 400 students, but they could only really take 60. So they needed to get rid of a lot of you. So they yeah, threw so everything at you right up front and whittle nice. you out. And I got knocked out pretty fast. Um, so that's when I switched over to doing psychology. Uh, but at the time, I'd already started to work for churches on the side. And I'd done a gap year between university and high school where I traveled around with a music and drama group that was um, an yeah, evangelical yeah. group. Yeah. And that's that's sort of where I decided, OK, well, let me let me give this a go. Let me let me see if I can jump in. To the you, what, so what was that like traveling? Because I, I read about that gap year and I listened to you talk about it, too. Mm. Is, was that was that an enjoyable time? Because I, and that's such, that's so, that's so unique. Not many people have done that. And do you enjoy singing still? It was the one, it was the one year of my life that I think changed me the most because I, I arrived that first day on training that year and I was an introvert, but I was your typical shy introvert. I didn't talk to people. I didn't really want to be on a stage. So, I mean, what was I doing there? You know, the whole year <laughs> yeah. was to get up on stages around the country. And I just remember sitting on the side in those first three days, three days is all I'm talking about. And realizing what this would actually take and watching everyone else you know their kind of look at me personalities come out and everyone was kind of loud in the room and trying to compete for parts on stage and all the rest of it and I thought if I don't change now I just need to go home because I'm not going to make it through this year and I, I made a decision like what does what does being an introvert but being a confident version of me look like because I need to find that right now and I, I made I, it's, a, it's one of the only times in my life I can point to making a decision about who I really wanted to be beyond just following the path of least resistance in my own personality and I think if being able to do that made me realize how much control we have over that stuff and that's yes I definitely over calibrated and faked some things as well and that's not that's that's not healthy but also I also was able to choose towards some different things and I think that year really shaped me in some in some interesting ways and obviously like being able to travel the way we did we were th we were in and out of three different countries uh, we would only ever stay a week in one place and we would do a series of shows and we would bail. Like it was a real kind of roadie lifestyle, but it was, it was a lot of fun. I think I grew up a lot in that. Was year. it safe? Yeah. I mean, South Africa at that time and Southern Africa, I mean, we were, we, we, we were, I think we were lucky when we did this. I mean, because uh, we would have been talking 96. Okay. So Nelson Mandela had been president for two years and, um, yeah, I mean, at that time, if, if this had been sort of 93, 94, I think there would have been concerns because no one was really sure which way the country was going to go. Yeah, but definitely. Nelson Mandela just stepped in and 
you know, he said no violence and everyone listened. And Ed, he really, one guy, just pulled that country together and Which something that could have turned into absolute bloodshed. It was a proper miracle. Anyone who lived through that knows it was a proper miracle. And I think by that point, 96, we knew, like, we're going to try and make the best of this country together. And there was a spirit of, you know, togetherness with that. South Africans will call it Ubuntu. Um, so I, I think by then, yeah, there was a lot more. I mean, obviously, it's still it's still a dangerous country in terms of crime and the rest of it. Very, very high crime rate. And, yeah. um, you know, I've had my fair share of running in, run in with, uh, with crime in South Africa. But, but everyone kind of knows that that's the way that it is. And you you just get yeah, heard people wear like their purses in the front, like from front of them, and or backpacks. All, all that stuff. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. Stick your stick your handbag strap under the leg chair that you're sitting on. You yeah. know, park a car length away from the car in front of you at the traffic light, so you can whip out into a bush if you need to, because you're getting a hijack. All that stuff. Yeah, there's things. Yeah, like I've heard that if you there's places too, like if you get in a car accident, you go to the next town sometimes yeah. because there's just but there's places like that all around the world. There's places yeah, that absolutely, and there's yeah. places because I always like I. It's funny. I wanted to. I wanted to either go into like to be a zoologist or mm. an archaeologist. And a lot of the places that I still are fascinated with, archaeology-wise, I cannot visit because they're mm -hmm. not, uh, they're in war zones or they're in places mm -hmm. that are not safe. But uh, I guess maybe that's part of the Mississippi. If it was something that was easy to visit, then it'd become Disneyland, and, mm -hmm. and maybe there'd be far too many people. There's already. I've already heard. I have a friend I, I interviewed who went went to Egypt for um, to Cairo for a barbecue place that they opened. <laughs> and they said that they were hustled over by the pyramids. Like there's like a hustle about getting on a camel. It's like kind of like they, don't, they you get on the camel and then you get off and they charge you two hundred dollars for. It. <laughs> mm -hmm. They don't tell you until you've already. And kind of like one of your things that you talked about when in the street photography uh, when you were discussing how you took a photo of somebody and then they said, "Oh, he was, he was cheap." He was a five 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 <laughs> something. Like that. Anyway, anyway, so then but then I really want to. I'm trying. I want to lead up to the part where you where you stole a bus. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but there's there's stuff in the middle. <laughs> there's definitely stuff in the middle of that was because when you were working for the church later on it was inspiring to you right i mean honestly it still is it's just, it's just that I, I i i can't work there anymore because we have differences of opinion about what's important but i mean the the m most of my time in the church was spent with young people so we're talking sort of uh kids right through the 35 year olds and a lot of what we did uh, and a lot of my job was youth young adult ministry or, or, and also poverty outreach so getting into local communities um you know feeding people soup kitchens helping them get id books helping them get into work yeah. that kind of stuff and you know i'll never i'll never look down on that work like i i, I it doesn't matter what institution it's for like we did a lot of good and I'm very, very proud of the stuff that we did. And I'm not just proud of the stuff we did with those people, but also getting teenagers and young adults uh, involved with helping other people changes them in yeah. profound ways, probably more than the people they're helping. I mean, the number of kids, I mean, anxiety is just an epidemic these days. Everyone seems to have proper anxiety. Everyone, everyone has an anxiety disorder, which I'm yeah. not sure is true. I think we just have anxiety. We've forgotten that all human That's beings have anxiety is <laughs> normal emotion. But yeah. um, the number of kids who claim, you know, I really, really struggle with anxiety. And the minute you put them to work helping other people, it evaporates because suddenly they get a bit of context in their life. And wow, this is what real issues look like. Mm -hmm. I don't have to make something up. I could point my life at something better. And suddenly my energies are put in a, in a, in a good direction to help other people. Like I, I think the church the church at its best when it's not when it's not arguing about petty things or trying to bully people into dogma can do an, can do some amazing stuff and mm -hmm. and 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 yeah i did see a lot of that and and i was a part of a lot of that and i think yeah I, I'll, I'll always find that stuff inspiring but then there was a shift right yeah yeah uh yeah so i mean i mean i think i think I started but that was because that could have been circumstantial, right? Like, like where you were, right? Or was it, it, it probably but, partly was. I mean, I think I think when I started in seminary, I was 21, just turned 21. So I'd finished my psychology degree. I'd done another year working for churches in Durban. And then I moved up to Johannesburg and started in seminary. And I think that first year in seminary, and I think this happens for a lot of people who go to seminary, your face starts to come apart. Because if, if the people who are teaching you do it right, and thankfully my lecturers did, they didn't feed me answers. They told me that there was a book of libraries, you know, a library full of books downstairs. There's a world of ideas out there. Everyone in the class has a different opinion. You bring back everything and let's talk about it here. And I had a class with uh, Kosa people, Zulu people, um, wow. Indian South Africans, Chinese South Africans, Afrikaans South Africans, myself, which have been more English South Africans. 
everyone with completely different backgrounds and worldviews. So when you add a theology to that, where you're trying to make sense of a God who exists in all these different cultures with all these different ideas, suddenly you start pulling at threads going, well, if that doesn't make sense to him, I can't pretend it makes sense to me. It has to make sense to everybody or it's my own cultural construction and not really true. So, mm-hmm. and you start pulling at those threads and things come unraveled very, very fast. So for me, I think by the time I left seminary, I already knew I wasn't going to last there very long, but I was just going to do it because I felt like there was a lot of good that I could do. And I still had a faith. It wasn't that it was just, it, I, I wouldn't take the Bible literally. There were loads of things that meant that actually I wasn't going to last in the institution because you had to do a bunch of stuff that I wasn't willing to do anymore. Yeah. And then I, I worked for seven churches all in all. And then the last, the last church, I was politely asked to leave because um, it came to a head with them because we had some very serious xenophobic attacks in Cape Town in 2008, okay. uh, which often kick off in South Africa where, you know, employment is, is incredibly low. I think there's something like 40% unemployment in South Africa, which is insane. And then you've That's got people coming in from Angola and Zambia and Somalia and setting oh, okay. up uh, corner shops and making some decent money in local communities but the rest of the community go, why don't we have jobs? And they decide en masse. It, it spreads like wildfire. We're going to go burn everyone else's shops down who's not a local South African. And this started kicking off and people were dying. And we basically went to the church and said, we need to get people out now. Uh, let's take the bus in and get them out. And uh, so they turned around to us and said, uh, no, because, uh, you know, God has given us the bus and we have to be good stewards of the bus. And it might get scratched or dinged or dented. And so we stole the bus, obviously. And we went in all day and bus people out, but we couldn't take them to the church because obviously they'd work out what we'd done, but also they weren't welcome there. I mean, we were even told with the, um, with the, with the guys that we ran soup kitchens with, we wanted to bring them to services on Sunday night because I ran the Sunday evening services. And we were told no, because they might mess up the furniture. And they'd installed metal spikes outside the front door of the church so they couldn't shelter under the porch in the rain and all this stuff and i was just like that that was kind of the the last straw for me and i started standing up on a sunday and saying guys we're full of crap like like the the, even the book we say we buy you know that that it's it, it seems obvious to me that if you if you think this guy is a real guy like a real jewish teacher who walked around he seemed to care more about poor people then he and, and, and he left his choicest insults for the religious leaders of his day. We are so far off the map. So I was basically um, asked to leave or oh, shut up or leave. And I said, I'm not going to shut up. That's not possible at this stage. But so you knew was, that was coming, right? Well, it, it, it had been a long time coming, honestly. And they'd been writing on the wall for a long time. It wasn't a shock. And I calculated, you know, I knew this was important enough to me to lose it. I wasn't willing to carry on and shut up about it. And yes, there was definitely like a part of me that was, you know, a 20 something young zealot who wanted to be a bit of an iconoclast. So there was definitely some yeah, ego. That age, there's... <laughs> but I still buy it. You know, I bought it. I still buy it today. It's just, mm-hmm. I, I, and, and I might it, do, Father. yeah. And I might do a couple of things differently now, but I think the choice at the end of the day still would have been the same. Did you have at that time, because I know that you talk about later in your life that you got into videography and photography, but did you have a pocket camera or any type of camera or were you taking any photos during that time not on the day-to-day no i think this was this was like before this i didn't even know there was like, this like, you mean like a throwaway camera like that i mean you used to have like a, i had a i had a plastic dv handy cam which was with a dv tape and a flip out screen yeah, but yeah, i'd yeah. never take it out for like random things so i wouldn't vlog with it for example that wasn't oh, a thing yeah. no of course not yeah but... you know phones couldn't take video at that point um these dv handy cams were a pain in the ass because you had to take the tape out and put it into a machine and then capture it into a computer and then convert a codec <laughs> and then try co- it that just wasn't worth it so yeah. i wasn't filming like we film now at all no but i did have one yeah because i yeah. did a little bit of video work on the side of church because it, it is amazing too there was a time and it's not too long ago that even sending one photo to somebody was a hassle or you had to email yeah. it to somebody and they had to be lucky enough to be able to figure yeah. out how, and then to print it up on like a dot matrix printer or something it was just it's amazing how easy i, I always it always it boggles my mind how much information is flowing at every any given time like say there's an event like a terrible yeah. event or a concert or how much <laughs> footage is or is it all it's amazing that it can all be stored somewhere it's it's, yeah. it's yeah. hard to imagine but then when you made your way back to you so then did from there did you go back to london or it was a couple of years in between where i i uh this is where a friend of mine came to me and he said well look you've 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 lost this career 
by your own choice as well because there were other churches asking me to go work for them and i just said i'm oh. i'm definitely out now you know i need to stop bumping my head against the same wall but my friend said to me well you might as well choose something you love to do now and try and make that a career and i'd already been doing the video stuff and enjoyed photography so i thought i wonder if i could make that a career so there were a couple of years where i tried to freelance in south africa with very like mixed success uh i was mostly waiting tables to pay the bills for a good few years yeah and then I picked up a job full time working for a company that sold fancy kitchen tools for a year in Cape Town called Yuppie Chef. I was their in-house like product photographer, videographer guy for, for a year. Oh, I see. And then when that ended, I, I decided, you know, that that was pretty much the only e-commerce photography job in the country at the time. They were the company that kept winning the, the e-commerce awards. I don't think any others really had the, the, the budget to be able to hire someone full time just to do that. So I thought yeah. I need to come back. And that's when I arrived here in 2012 and then sort of hit the ground running from there and picked up work photographing sofas. Yeah. So it's back to sort of product photography for a bit. That was a good four years. But that year. times people like structure like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you have to remember, like I just come out of waiting tables and, and the, the waiting table thing was particularly humiliating because I was doing it around the corner from the church I used to work at. So I went almost overnight from standing up on a stage on Sundays and having 300 people listen to every word I said to going around the corner to make peanuts wedding tables at a cafe where those people would come in often yeah, I and I would have to serve them their coffee and shut up and get out of the way so they could have their conversation. So it was a massive ego knock and probably a good thing for me. And then, uh, you know, when I, when I finally started to make headway and be able to make money with a camera in hand, the fact that it wasn't creatively fulfilling was like a luxury I didn't even think about at the time. I was just grateful That's a good to point. be able to. And so, yes, it was very technical and very repetitive work. And, uh, but I had to design systems and come up with lighting that worked. So there was initially a lot of creative stuff to set it up. And then, yes, it was every day just plowing through a production line of sofas, which wasn't very exciting. But then I just used to make sure that I was taking photographs in my own time that were creatively fulfilling for me. So I didn't hate my camera at the end of the day. But was that your camera and your lighting equipment at that place? Uh, yeah. So, so it was all my cameras, my lenses and everything else, but they did buy their own lighting, which was yeah. good. But I mean, again, I mean, big companies should be buying all their own gear. They shouldn't be asking photographers <laughs> no, of course. to use their, Hey, do you mind just using your kit? I mean, this is a, this was a big company. They wanted to put themselves on the stock exchange and stuff. And now I'm using my own cameras. I'm like, come on. Yeah, so yeah, they'll yeah. all try and cut corners, but yeah, I mean, that means, well, when I, when I leave, I take it with me. So now you've got to get somebody who's got nice camera gear again, which is what, what did you, what kind of time camera time. did you start out with? And I, and, and I, this doesn't get too gear heavy. And also no, it's not, it I don't doesn't matter you, what you those product days, I was shooting on the Canon 5d Mark twos and okay. the lens of choice was just a, a 24 to 105 f4 lens uh, which was basically the kit lens for the for the 5d mark ii because it's a super versatile lens focal length for, for for shots like that but also when you're shooting products generally you don't want to be shooting with a shallow depth of field anyway so i was sure always shooting between f11 and f16 so i didn't need that kind of that sort of super sexy, big chunky yeah. prime that can go down to 1.4 because I never <laughs> yeah, shot yeah. there because you don't want out of focus areas when you're trying to do clean cutouts onto white backgrounds. So yeah, pretty basic kit. But the, I mean, that that Canon 5D Mark II, those were tanks of cameras. They were brilliant to use. They were really, really good. So I use a 5D Mark IV. And, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I, I cannot call myself a photographer someday. Maybe. No, and I've often asked to ask people, what did you feel like you can call yourself a photographer? Was there hey, a man, if you take photos, you're a photographer. Yeah, I, I know. That's very true. But then, then yeah. everyone is because they have them on their phone. They can. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you might not be a professional photographer, but you're, you're definitely a photographer. When you can consider. Yeah. Like I've often wondered when you consider yourself a professional photographer and does that require payment or does that require a certain skill level or that... i think i think it's payment i think it's that simple i think it's when people are willing to give you money for the thing you do yeah i mean because if you start saying well it's it's a particular set of skills everyone will disagree about what those skills are and i know some incredible photographers who aren't very technical they don't know a lot of skill but they have an amazing sense of how to use a camera on auto you know so i think yeah when people are willing to hire you to do what you do and you can produce work uh at a, at a particular consistency i think this is what i tell photographers who want to make photography a job is you have to remember this is not about that one photograph you took that you think is brilliant it's about being able to do that or get very close when a client asks you on a day when the conditions aren't there 
-hmm. it's it's consistency can you produce a particular standard of photography for anybody no matter what the situation is because you know some of what you're doing you can't That's rely cool. on those three shots you took once that are brilliant that you put on your website can you do that again can you do that again on demand then you can mm -hmm. i think feel and more you, can you back it up and make sure that you didn't uh you put your card in properly I mean, that, you, yeah. that you that you kept everything charge your batteries yeah yeah you charge your battery and everything yeah like i have i had one the one the one moment where i'm like i should have had three batteries instead of or because <laughs> and i didn't even i only had one at the time but i thought okay there's it takes it takes those realizations but when you were shooting the sofas did you feel competent as a photographer yeah, I mean, I, I'd had, um, I'd, done, I'd done a lot of training for myself online, all self-taught and study yeah. anywhere. Um, I'd done that year uh, with the food photography company where I learned a lot about product photography and they knew they were taking a little bit of a chance on me because they knew that I could, I could photograph competently, but they also knew because I was very honest with them that product photography specifically was new to me. And they were like, well, we're a growing company. We're happy to work on this together. So I learned a lot there. And then I think by the time I went to this company to shoot sofas, I realized like I knew the technicals about how to do product photography, but the scale was going to be different because yeah. I think there's a thousand videos online at the time on how to do tabletop product photography with small products and small oh, yeah. lights. But there was very little about how do you shoot a, a dining table with 12 chairs around it so that yeah. you get clean lines, you don't get a mess of shadows underneath, and also that you're... Uh, lighting all of that so that it it looks it looks good um, natural, and obviously yeah. you're going to need six seven lights to do that that scale and watch out for reflections and and yeah. things shining off varnish all that kind of stuff I, I wasn't sure about the scale and I think I, I basically said to them yes I'll do the job and then I quickly made sure I knew what I was doing before I arrived and then yeah I mean I knew I was confident on day one that I knew way more than they did so they wouldn't be able to pick up my mistakes as I went <laughs> and did, I would yeah. be able to learn fast um, yeah, I mean, they're, 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 I was already going to be able to take their photography from fairly crap to pretty good. And then I was going to tweak it to great as I went along. So I was did fairly you, confident. Did you from there, did you start doing things on your own? Because you're doing this street photography. And when you describe street photography, I don't know if I've thought of it the way and maybe it's because it's London and it's different, but I never thought of it. In, a, in the aspect of the, the, the legalities or people confronting you. But I also never do that i never come up like yeah. I'm, and maybe and because everything's so spread out here too there's not a whole lot of yeah those tight spaces you're doing street photography with your phone and you're being that was in, in, inspiring but what how did you get to the next street photography was like i i did it as a as an antidote to the day job because it was getting technical and so i just decided i had a route from the train station back to my flat in london which took me about half an hour to walk every day to to the station and back from the station at the end of the day and I just gave myself a little challenge saying, well, to get photography back for myself, I'll just use, I think I had an iPhone six at the time. I'm just going to walk this route and I'm going to try and take one photograph that I like between here and home. And I don't have to slow down much. I'm just going to shoot intuitively and see if I can get one photo at least that I can post online that I think is sort of interesting oh. just to get back into creating intuitively and not having to worry about, you know, seven lights and settings in camera and white balance and all the rest of it. And uh, from there, I realized pretty quickly that I didn't want to do uh, photography that was confrontational at all because it doesn't suit my personality type. So I didn't photograph people as much as I photographed interesting light and shadow that was falling in spaces. And then when I started to pick up little cameras that I could specifically use for street photography, I started with the Fujis, the X100s, XT20s. And in more recent years, I've been using the Ricoh GRs, the GR2, GR3, oh. and GR3X recently, just because it's a pocketable little camera that I can pull out and have with me all the time. And I do shoot for more light, shadow, and space than I do for people. And so technically, a lot of people will tell you that's not street photography. And I don't necessarily disagree with them because I think street yeah. photography in the very traditional sense is it's kind of like daily reportage of people interacting with mm -hmm. each other, which I'm less interested in. Um, I shoot Same. more in the style of photographers like uh, Ray Metzger and Fan Ho, who weren't concerned with the people. They mm -hmm. were more concerned with like shapes and shadows. And when people did appear in their images, they're often silhouettes. So you can't even see who they are. Mm -hmm. I like that because it's less confrontational. It's more graphical in nature. So I just took that as a challenge. And that kind of leads to, because I, <laughs> again, this is all over the place, but I wanted to talk to you about how you talk about it was important to have photography heroes or heroes in mm. a, f a field 
that you're interested in. You mentioned Van Ho and Edward Hopper. Oh, Edward Hopper. Yes. Edward Hopper is obviously an American uh, painter um, mm-hmm. who, who is very influential for me as a photographer because he, I was photographing a lot of people moving through spaces, but just sort of at a distance. So they were quite small in the frame as a sense of scale. They were often in shadow, but just moving through a space. And I, I kind of did that more intuitively. You know, I was just, that's what I was drawn to. Mm-hmm. And I think when I saw his paintings, I mean, his, his most famous painting is probably Nighthawks, which you'll know is the sort of corner diner. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's got loads of paintings of people in urban spaces on their own in like quiet moments of reverie or walking around in spaces. And um, it made me realize that, you know, I wasn't really doing anything that new. You know, this is someone who's, who, who, who used this as subject for his paintings that I was now using for my photographs. Just people moving alone through urban spaces. And I mean, that might not say anything or it might, you know, maybe it talks about, you know, how we feel a bit isolated, even though Mm. we're surrounded by people all the time. Maybe myself, I don't like crowds. So you'll find me on the edge of crowds, walking alone somewhere, taking a back street rather than walking down a busy street. Like that's who I am. And I guess at a point I sort of realized, well, maybe the reason I photograph that stuff is because I see myself in those people, you know, Mm. that single figure Mm -hmm. moving through, through a bit of space in an urban setting and, yeah, he 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 opened a he opened a piece of what I was doing intuitively. And Fan Ho is someone you hadn't heard about prior to your photography, right? Then you said meant people had mentioned it. Yeah, I'd started posting those sort of photographs, and it was other people. In fact, Hopper was the same. It was people who got under those photographs that I was already taking and posting. Who said, "Oh, this reminds me of Fan Ho." Oh, gotcha. I'm like Fan Who, and I went and had to look him up, and then go, "Okay, yeah, I can see that." So what was he doing? You know, this is someone who did it long before me. Okay, what can I learn from that? And then someone else went, well, this, this photo reminds me of an Edward Hopper painting. Hang on, who's Edward Hopper? And then I find him and that would unlock a new piece. And I think, you know, people helping me by, by giving me these echoes of other artists kind of gave me permission to keep doing what I was already doing when I also had people going, well, this is not real street photography. So kind yeah. of invalidating what I was doing. It's like, well, it might not be, but it is whatever those people were doing, those legitimate artists. So keep going. Yeah. Label it however you want, but people have trodden this path already. And when that leads to a little bit of, of your discussion about criticism, what do you, because that's, it, especially in the online community when you're posting things and, and when you're taking photos and, and sharing them or doing any type of art and sharing them, you're exposing yourself and you're, you're opening yourself up. And I found that and it's, and I have, I've had to, like, even in doing these, I've had to, you know, kind of <laughs> take away the fact that, you know, number one, it, it, I, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm sharing somebody else's world and not me as a person. But I also have to, you know, I, I get the strangest comments and I've just had to like bite my tongue and just, and what do you think of criticism? Like, what's your, your opinion? I mean, I mean, yeah, if, you, if you're going to share your work online, you're going to be criticized. That's just the fact. And I think you have to calculate that before you do it, whether it's on a YouTube channel or on Instagram or wherever. If you share your work, there will be people who come along and tell you you're rubbish. That's just the way that it is. But I think you really have to learn not to take that stuff seriously. And I, and, and I, I mean, the, I, I've said it in a video before, but I, you'll never find a talented troll. You're never going to get someone who's leaving crappy comments on your work going, you're complete rubbish. And you're going to click on their profile, go through and look and just be blown away by the quality of their photography, for example. Mm-hmm. You're always trolled by fellow frustrated creatives who aren't getting any traction for their own work. And so they're looking to bring everyone else down to the level that they feel they're at because they're not making any headway instead of working on themselves to build themselves up and put it out there. Everything's a competition and it's easier to bring everyone else down than better yourself. So I, I think you need to learn where those sort of comments come from and, and realize that it's really not worth engaging. And really what they want is, is any kind of attention. They, want they just that, yeah. want you to interact. Mm-hmm. And, and then they feel they won. And if they feel you, if, if they feel you interact with them at all, then they can go, oh, you're so offended. You know what I mean? They just, they want that. Like, yeah, got him. That's all they want. So the, 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 the thing I do most often is, and there, there are great features on both Instagram and YouTube is what's it called on YouTube. I think it's called hide user. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I haven't tried that. But I, basically I, it doesn't delete their comment on either. If you just go hide user from channel, they can still see their own comment. I can still see their comment, but nobody else can. But you can make so it live, I can make it public if you want to. Is that something like that? I could that, do, but yeah. usually I just leave it. Yeah. So and I'll, I'll let them post. I won't respond. I'll hide you. If it's something that's deliberately provocative and mean and just trying to poke you, 
I'll just hide user from channel. So they still keep checking back with their comments there, but they can't work out why no one's interacting with it or responding to it. I think is the best treatment for, for mm -hmm. people like that. Because I think for me, there's criticism. There are two tests. Like, does the person who's criticizing you know what they're talking about? Because I'm not listening to you if I, if, if uh, when you're trying to comment on my photography, unless you know something about what I'm doing. Because if you don't have a particular skill set, then, then I don't know if you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's the example I use in the book is if a first year acting student writes an email to Tom Hanks to tell him he doesn't know how to act in his latest movie and starts yeah. telling him you're a rubbish actor, Tom Hanks. I hope Tom Hanks is not going to listen to that first year acting student. And he might be generous and, you know, sort of put him down kindly, but he's not going to change his acting style because of an, an unknown first year acting student thinks he suddenly knows everything. There's, but if Anthony Hopkins gets on the phone and says, hey, do you want some yeah. notes on your last thing? He's going to listen. He might not change anything, but he is going to listen because it, there's expertise involved. So one, you have to know what you're talking about for me to listen to you. And the other is I have to know you care because it's that, it's that Theodore Roosevelt you know, quote that says, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. If, if, if I know you care about me and my journey mm -hmm. and you really want to see me get better, then I'm, I want yeah, to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if you're just jealous or you're angry that you're not succeeding and you're throwing out vitriol, I'd, nothing you say means anything positive or negative, by the way. That's the other thing is I don't take the positive comments very seriously either well, because I don't know if you know important. what you're talking about. I'm not mm -hmm. going to let the positive comments inflate my ego like they're a big deal. It, it works for positive and negative. You have to have expertise, know what you're talking about, and you have to, I have to know you care and that you mean what you're saying. I think that's, and that's, that's a great lesson, and that's a hard lesson to learn is to not take all the positive notes too because mm. – I think that in the end, like your friends all want you to be happy and they want so that or people that that know you. And so they'll <laughs> overinflate your ego and they'll they'll say things. But and then also like in, in your book, you get you you break down specifically what e ego has the word ego has changed. The definition of what people think ego is has changed. And we won't discuss it in this, but I again you should I'll put link, a link below to your book. Your book is also available on audio. I am in the United States. I, I was able to download it. So it's, it is something that I, I actually, it was like a test <laughs> to see if it worked. I think it went through PayPal or something. It was so easy. It was, it's, and it, it's available on it. Your book's available on Amazon and all. Well, I want to talk about the book, but I wanted to talk about before I got into the success, like I, I was curious as to when, like how surprising the success of your YouTube channel and everything was to you, but your voice. I've also, like, I've, I've talked to a lot of friends. I keep saying, I can't find my voice. I don't have I don't feel, and I, and I feel, I don't know if I ever will find hundred percent, but I'm always searching. I'm searching for my voice in everything creative that I do. Can you talk a little about a bit about voice? And yeah, I, I, I guess I'll use myself as an example with the YouTube channel. I think, I think where my voice comes from on that channel is pretty obvious. It's, it's, it comes from everything that came before. So there in there is my psychology degree is in there because that that became a fascination for me and I found it interesting. So there's a lot of me talking about psychology. Yeah. There is definitely a preacher tone in there because I was a preacher. So the way that I put together a video is exactly the same as I used to script out a sermon and the way that I deliver it. You know, I wasn't a very oh, that's preachy yeah. preacher. I, was, I definitely spoke to young people. So I was making it accessible. I wasn't like a, a traditional preacher at all. But I mean, I, what I used to do was more like a TED talk, if I'm honest. But that that style of communication... Yeah ability to tell a story, all those things were built in that time in the church. And that, that part of my voice is definitely in there as well. Um, since leaving the church, I devoured books on philosophy because I wanted to fill the void that was left from, I still wanted to be a good person in the world, but I didn't have this neat Christian framework anymore. And so I started to read far and wide about what does it mean to try and be a good person, which took me down these philosophy routes and especially the Stoics. And then that all got built in there as well. So I think anybody who is struggling to find their voice, I think what you need to realize is your voice is not the thing that you look around you and you go, okay, well, who's doing something successful? I'll copy what they're doing. Oh, yeah, it's working yeah. out who you are before you start and going, mm -hmm. uh, where was I born? What's my worldview? What's my personality type? What things do I care about? What things do I think about a lot? What do I like to read? What do I like to watch? What have I studied? What are my particular skill sets? Um, what, what is my life experience and how has that colored everything that I see as well? And that then gets 
filtered through whatever your particular artistic skill is that you built yourself. Because I think we stop at, well, um, I learned how to do good watercolors. I'm like, well, that's great, brilliant. But you, you, you are quickly going to get stuck with, well, I bought the watercolors and I got the, I've got the sketchbooks and I've got all my paint brushes, but now I don't know what to paint. That's mm -hmm. when your voice starts. It's True. not where it ends. You know, building the skill set is is not really where your voice comes out. It's 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 after that. It's working out what you want to say with the skill set. So I think it's like. Um, and photographers particularly make this mistake because they get obsessed with techniques and gear. Mm -hmm. So they go, well, when I get that magical 51.2 lens on that full frame <laughs> camera, and then I learned this one trick that I can do where you stitch images together and it looks like a super shallow depth of field. That's my style. But I promise you, you're going to get that quote unquote style and you're going to go like, well, I don't know what to say with this now. Yeah. That's when your voice actually starts to come out. And that's the, the harder journey to take is to go in and go, who am I though? And what do I want to say with this camera in my hand? Exactly. That's, that's where your voice starts to emerge. That's what I'm struggling with. And that's, and then, yeah. and in, in the world that, that I realm in the, the barbecue and food world, mm. there's a lot of people doing a lot of the same things. Yes. And, and I want to stand, I want to stand out just in my own head, not just to, yes. for them, but for myself. And I want to see things from my vantage point within my head. And so I find that, that's what I'm still struggling for because I don't, I don't want to duplicate things. There are people that I, there's people that I admire and I'd like to mm. be able to take amazing photos like they take, but I also want to say it with, I want to say, I want Kevin to say it as opposed to like replicating specifically what they do. Do you think you found your voice? I um, mean, it's constantly evolving. I wouldn't want to say I'm done at all. Yeah. No, I mean, no, I, I hope, I hope it keeps changing, yeah. you know, and it, it, it definitely, I think it's definitely shifting all the time. Um, it's, it's all down to self-awareness, you know? I mean, if you really are struggling, you're not really sure what to point this thing at, do a personality test, you know, ask your friends, what are the things that I constantly talk about in conversations? They'll tell you what you're in, you're really interested in if you can't work it out for yourself, because yeah. like you say, you picked, you picked this topic of barbecues and food. Okay. But that's, that's the broad topic. What else are you interested in? Yeah. Yeah. People, how are you interested in people? How can you start to feed that flavor into how you talk about this thing that everyone else talks about as well? How can you make it yours? I think the way that I talk about photography is very different to the way another photography channel might talk about photography. And oh, that's because doubt, yeah. I took very, very seriously trying to build in as many pieces of myself. I mean, if, if I'm honest, I think, I think it's no secret on my channel that actually photography is a little bit of a Trojan horse that, you know, that I'm more interested in other stuff. Yeah. The, the topic might be photography, but actually it's not really what I'm interested in talking about. No. I mean, people, I, I'm, I think it made it over there to the States, but that there's this, um, there was a long running show on TV here called Top Gear about cars, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, which made it around the world everywhere, but no one watched it because of cars. We watched it because there were three guys messing around who were obviously friends. Yeah, That's yeah. why we watched it and the mm -hmm. little adventures they went on. Cars was the topic, but that's not, not why any of us watch. That's where the best things come about is from yeah. when it's not specifically about, like it, you think it's about what it is, but it turns out it's really not about that. So, so find your topic. That's cool. But then also work out what else do you care about deeper that you can mm. feed in to give it its flavor. I think that's yeah. the trick. And that's, and that's why, that's why um, when my friend Kelly Endell, who's a photographer, when she mentioned your channel, and then I started to devour it and I've devoured it kind of the way I've devoured your book, like in chunks, like I've gone all mm -hmm. over the place, but it's, it, 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 it resonates with me and it touches, it hits me in a different place than a lot of the specific videos. Like there's a lot of channels that are just about gear or mm -hmm. how to, you know, how to videos or, and you, you get into little things, you do a lot of, you get into some how to stuff, but it's mostly, it's about being more self-aware. Yeah. Self-awareness is a big one for me. Yeah. Cause yeah. I think that's, that's, I've realized one of the things that's changed my life the most is getting to know myself better and, and how I'm wired good and bad. Um, and I, I, I push that quite hard because I really think it's a key that unlocks so many things for someone. It's a hard road. Yeah. And that's all. Yeah. When you find out truths about yourself, those are some of the hardest truths to, you know, to swallow. Because, oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> because yeah. you think, cause I said, I think we kind of trick ourselves into thinking that we are one type of person or one person and then you start to realize really who you are and you've gone through similar things and we're not going to touch into that, but you've gone through certain life events that I've gone through. Mm. And when you were honest about it on your channel and I, I'll, I'll 
I'm going to put a companion blog piece with this and I'll, I'll put cool. links to a number yeah. of different things that you discuss, but it's, yeah. it also, I think it's important that you feel like it's when you're using a camera, you're communicating, you're trying to see better. You're, there's a lot of things that you touch on within your videos. It's, it's, it's amazing. When did, when did your, like, was there a moment when your, your channel gained so much success? Like, did you, and were you shocked by this? Are you shocked now by the success? I mean, or now, you, I'm, now I, it's, I, feel, I guess that you're maybe used to it. <laughs> yeah. I feel quite differently about it now, honestly, but I, I think probably uh, about a year in, I think it really started to pick up. And I think that's true for a lot of people. I, I've, I've sort of talked to a lot of other people who do this sort of on YouTube and they, they seem to say that I think you have to post pretty consistently for a year for YouTube to go, okay, well, they're sticking around. So it's worth giving this a push on the algorithm because yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone starts a, starts a YouTube channel in January and abandons it by the second week in January. Do you know what <laughs> no, I mean? No true. one, no. So there's no point, there's no reason, there's no motivation for them to push your work until they can tell that you're sticking around and you're serious about this. So probably about a year in, but I mean, I've seen a huge slow in growth in the last, in the last oh, really? two years since the pandemic, massive slowdown. So I take it all with a huge pinch of salt. You know, I don't, I don't trust it. I don't, I don't think like I deserve any of this. I don't think like I've done anything special. Um, I found an audience who seemed to care about this stuff. And a lot of them have moved on as well, which is why I'm always concerned about um, finding that core audience who who uh who kind of really care about what you do who are going to stick with you because that's not everybody you know mm. i mean most people will will check in one day because you told them how to use one speed light for a portrait they'll hit subscribe they'll move on they'll never remember you again they're gone and i'm not interested in that big subscriber number because most of those people aren't around anymore it's just that core who stick with you yeah uh, that, that i'm trying to serve the whole time do you, are there moments where you don't feel like posting for a while like have you gone on little breaks and things like is that um not really because I, I i from the very beginning like i i never gave myself this kind of aggressive youtuber schedule of having to push out multiple videos a week i always said i'm only ever going to do one video a month because i knew that no matter what else was going on in my life and for most of those first few years i had a full-time job i knew i could do one video a month and that wasn't a big deal so i mean honestly this is this is a big part of my job so you know if i can't put out one video a month then I'm just being lazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Uh, so no, I, yeah, no, it I've seemed never like given it was myself a, that one a week. I thought it's, it's a, yeah. but maybe, yeah, was, maybe I, I stumbled upon you a little bit later into your progression. I usually do two, two a month now at this stage, but I, I've only ever promised yeah. one a month. Put these out on YouTube and on, on podcast, but I also, there's a lot of other facets of what I do, but it's just, I, I'm, I'm, I've never spoken to anybody specifically about their YouTube channel. And mm. it was, I was just curious coming yeah, yeah. from, coming from you. And then, but, but did you always feel like you had a book in the back of your mind? Or was that something that you, and you talk about things too in this, that I think there's a second book in you. I'm sure there probably is. Uh -huh. um, it's, actually, it's actually the second book I've written this one. Um, I wrote a book 10 years ago when I left the church uh, that I self-published back in South Africa. Oh. Um, so it wasn't my first crack at writing a book, but it was definitely, um, I think it was 2018, I reckon. I'd gone away to Iceland for my birthday on my own, one of these little retreats to a log cabin. Oh, that's awesome. And yeah, it was good. And uh, the weather was awful. So I was stuck inside. And I remember just as an exercise, um, I started to sketch out the idea for this book, uh, putting together sort of a chapter sequence and what sort of things I'd like to talk about. And uh, yeah, just at the beginning, I think it was March of 2020. So just before we all went into lockdown, um, I met with a US publisher who came over for the London Book Fair, who wanted to have a meeting. Um, and shame they got off the plane, got to the hotel and were told the London Book Fair was cancelled. So literally the meeting with me was the only thing they did on the trip. Hey. Um, and they just said, do you want to do a book? Because, you know, I think publishers are always looking for somebody where they can get a few guaranteed book sales because people have got a built in audience. Yeah, exactly. And I said, yeah, I, I, I am keen, but they did more sort of educational stuff. I'm, so I'm not interested in the educational one. I already have the outline. I know exactly what I want to do. This is it. If you want to do it, that's cool. If not, I'm going to do it on my own. Um, and to be fair to them, yeah, they, they sort of took a step out and we did something that they haven't really done up to this point. And so it gave me something great to do while being stuck at home for six months in lockdown. It was kind of perfect yeah. timing. I could just, just sit and plow away every day. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's, yeah. and it's nice. I, if, if someone's listening to this or watching this and they enjoy listening to you speak or watch your videos, it is nice to download it too, because it is nice to hear you like it's it's your voice you're it, and i actually what's funny is when i read it i i hear your damn voice <laughs> like it's yeah, like, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, this is you speaking it's not a lot of times yeah. like you'll read 
from from different authors and it's not necessarily you can't hear their the sound of their voice but it's it's funny you you are speaking through this but that's but i also feel like that beginning portion of your life could be like a semi-fictional there's there's like a there's a lot of like you've you've had a lot of adventures and things mm. as a child that i think people would appreciate you know learning about because you've mm. experienced things that other people haven't experienced mm. i i think but so so then what are your goals now what do you are you like you're still are you still photographer like, so you're a freelance photographer as well because you have loads and loads of photos i mean technically i am i don't i honestly don't get a lot of photography work though because well two reasons one i've moved out of london up to yorkshire so obviously the, the work is a lot um less available uh and the other reason is i think that people assume well you've got such a big youtube channel of course people hire you all the time but they forget that my youtube channel is full of photographers and who are the last people on the planet who hire photographers <laughs> other photographers you know like so yeah. i get i get hired a lot to train other people or teach other people um i don't get hired to do the photography work as much anymore because i've shifted into that space uh so yeah is that I don't something know. I mean, if, if people want to how are you for that? Is that something that you would? Yeah, do? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 uh, I am starting up sort of, uh, I'm hopefully middle of the year, I'm going to start up doing sort of one-to-one -one mentoring again. Mm -hmm. uh, I do want to get back to doing portrait photography workshops and traveling around and doing those a little bit too. Uh, I've got a creative retreat, which I'm running in June. That I was going to talk about that. Yeah, it's full at the moment. I think there might be one space left, but I think it's probably full at this stage. Um, but that's in Tuscany and Italy. And I wanted to sort of make the creative retreat sort of digging in on some of the content of the book as well. Something that I do fairly regularly uh, going forward in the years. And then, yeah, it's just a bit of, bit of everything. It's, you know, the book and keeping the channel going and doing my own photography projects. Uh, yeah. I sell a book of photography every year and uh, yeah, that's that, that kind of keeps me going for now, although things are definitely changing. So I am looking for other things to do as well and sort of to branch, branch out a little bit sell a book of photography you mean you have you put together a book and you sell like a thousand copies or something is that yeah so it's they're called collections uh I've, i'm on collection five this year oh. uh and uh i sell those from my website hard copy so it's 90 images every year 45 color 45 black and white with some of the quotes from some of the videos in the same year okay is that something that when does that go on sale usually goes on sale in January. So uh, anyone who keeps an eye out and when they, when they're gone, they're gone. So they're kind of limited. So it's been sold, it's runs. sold out. I uh, no, there are copies left for this year. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's on, is it on your a link on your website? On my, on my website. Yeah. Okay. I, I wanted to discuss the importance you could, because you discuss it, the importance of walks and mm. do you listen to music when you're on your walks? Cause you said a lot, how important it is to think on your walks. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the reason I started walking was just because, I think it was sort of to replace prayer time from church, you know, like prayer time for me was just, and it wasn't, I think I took prayer very loosely. I wouldn't sort of sit and necessarily say a bunch of stuff or ask for things. It was more like just meditation and being quiet, you know? Um, but I do find that just sort of sitting and staring at a wall, my mind bounces around quite a lot. And I found the, the, the best way to sort of let my mind click into that sort of subconscious space was to go for a walk. And then, uh, yeah, I, so I, I, I made it kind of a regular practice and still do now to go on regular long walks. That was when I do my best thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes, yeah, I listen to podcasts or sometimes I listen to music or sometimes okay. nothing at all. I just want to be quiet. And the whole, the whole reason for it is because, I mean, I think the, it's fairly common to sort of say to people, you know, when do you get your best ideas? And they'll say something like in, when I'm in the shower, yeah. you know, because because it's one of the few times in our lives where we don't have stimuli in front of us. We don't have a screen where we're watching television or yeah. on the computer or reading emails. We're literally in there on our own and we're quiet and there's water falling and our mind starts processing on a different level. It's not trying to force, you know, conscious solutions through. It's just sort of doing That's, that creative yeah. processing our subconscious does. So it's whatever works for you to let yourself get into that space where you have that, what I call like generative mental space, where you can shut down the sort of very busy mind and let your subconscious go to work. And walking really does that for me. So yeah, I just make it quite a regular practice to head out on fairly long walks. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And are there specific, because you mentioned Fan Ho and then uh, Edward, Edward Hopper, but are there photographers right now that are your heroes or the ones that have passed? Because, and I'll put, I'll put links below and I'll put in the, and the um the companion blog piece as well about 
people that are inspired by other people, other people that inspire you now, or, or, or is there other too many to name? And then you don't want to, yeah, there's them. a lot. I mean, I can give you a selection. There are a lot of photographers. I, yeah. I suppose, um, Sebastian Salgado is one of my favorites, uh, black and white, mostly film photographer through most of his career, but has photographed some of the most heavy subject matter, uh, with refugees and, oh war zones and workers around the planet and everything else. And recently he's just put out a book called Genesis, trying to find corners of the planet where they look like they're untouched by human beings. And he's put out this beautiful black and white book called Genesis, which just is like the planet before us, basically, is what he's trying to create. So beautiful stuff. Steve McCurry is someone for me who who has been um, amazing, like a a hero in, in terms of portrait photography, particularly and traveling around the planet and finding you know, people from all corners of the world and those interesting faces that tell stories. He's obviously like the Afghan girl fame, that famous uh, um, Nat Geo cover. But yeah, I mean, has done thousands upon thousands of of portraits through the years. Alex Webb is someone I'm really enjoying at the moment, who's a photographer who's very creative use of of light, shadow and color. It was was sort of also a nice sort of, because I'm shooting a lot more color. I used to shoot a lot more black and white. So he's been someone who's so teaching me a lot about composition and graphical shapes in photography as well. A young photographer named Joey L, uh, Joey Lawrence out of New York, uh, fantastic photographer who's 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 I've kind of watched. I think he's younger than me. He's he, but he's one of these guys who, you know, has that all the commercial chops that you want to have, but puts his his money into airplane tickets for him and his crew so he can go and take photographs with the holy men on the banks of the Ganges or oh, tribes wow. in the Omo Valley and like produces some gorgeous, gorgeous portraits. And, and he even got a tribe in the Omo Valley to write their own film and then cast themselves yeah. in it. And he took a film crew over and filmed their film for them. And That's it's beautiful. Amazing. So somebody who's trying to take his particular skill set and use it in really creative ways to help people who might not have access to that stuff is, is someone wow. I find very impressive. Okay. I'll, I'll put links below to, for p- other people, but I, I'll definitely check all the people out. I, mm. And that's, that's, re- that's really interesting. Do you find yourself, do you ever want to travel further and have you been to the United States? Yeah. I've been to the States a few times. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I enjoy travel, uh, you know, having grown up being bouncing around the world as I have, it's, I don't, I don't find that big a deal. Um, but yeah, I just, I love, seeing new places i love i love seeing how different people think and what they value and i especially when you get outside of the cities i find that really fascinating and yeah. encouraging so yeah i mean honestly mostly only uh africa the us and europe are the, are the places yeah. i've stuck to but i'd love to see south america i'd love to see asia yeah, i've got a lot of places i'm i've still need to go but yeah I have you gone that. back to iceland and have you been able to shoot it not yet. I haven't been back since that that last trip. No, which has been my only trip. Because that looks when I everything I've seen. I watched YouTube videos of Iceland. Like, yeah, like a maniac. It, it looks so beautiful. It looks unworldly. It looks. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's 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 one of those unique landscapes. If you see a picture of Iceland, you know it's Iceland straight mm-hmm. away mm-hmm. because there's nowhere that really looks like that. So maybe the Faroe Islands, but that kind of yeah, I was gonna say the yeah, Faroe Islands, very yeah. very similar. Yeah. I get, I'm on a somehow a YouTube algorithm for the Faroe Islands. Yeah, yeah. Somehow, yeah, yeah. Every time it pops up, I'm like, that's beautiful. Oh, of course, it's the Faroe Islands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why. But thank you so much for taking your time, Sean. I, I, I really appreciate this. I've been looking forward to this. And I appreciate what you're doing and what you're sharing. And I think it's not just, you're not just put it pumping out a YouTube channel. And you can do that. People can do whatever they want. But I feel like there's heart and there's soul behind what you're doing. And your book is fantastic. And i'll put it here again well i'll put a i'll put a picture of the cover do you have an image of the cover you can send me uh, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but i i just i i appreciate what you're doing and i hope to you know i hope you continue what you're doing because i, I love following your work and i'm inspired daily by what you do so i appreciate it thank you yeah, thanks for taking the time you're very welcome thanks for having me